know you. We thank you because you are the Lord that controls the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything that lives in it. You are the Lord who gave us the power of forgiveness. And you gave us the strength to live each day for you. Lord, we have come to your presence. A time to reflect on oneself. To learn from your throne. Open our understanding. With the help of your Holy Spirit, guide us. Teach us what you want us to know. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brethren, today you are welcome to this open fellowship. Today we use opportunity to train the trainer. Our topic for today is the power of forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. You no, know, sometime in life we need to understand that as believer we need to forgive those who trespass against us so that our trespasses can also be forgiven. There is no man that lives on earth that is perfect that since he was born he has never sinned. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. And because all have sinned and we have four shots of God's glory. And that's why God commended his love towards us. While we are yet sinner, Christ died for us. And this death was to reconcile us back to God. Not because we love God, but because he loved us. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world. It is not the world who loved God, but it is God who loved mankind. And why would God good extra mind to redeem us back to himself because the bible said by one man's sins we all died so it only take the righteousness of one man for we to come alive for amnesty to be given to a condemned criminal it takes the power of an attorney a judge or the governor or the president of the people. If not, the amnesty cannot be valid. A convict cannot give amnesty to himself. Just as a convict cannot give amnesty to himself, we as unbelievers, we do not have that state power, that willpower, ability to be able to pardon our own sin. It doesn't matter how many tears we share or how many religious obligations we do or whether we are the most holy person on earth we can still not pardon ourselves. There are three form formats of sin. There are sins which are inherent. These sins which are inherent are the sins which we were born into. Because why did this sin matter in our life as believers? The Bible says that I am the Lord thy God, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children, unto the fifth, sixth, and seventh generation of them that know not God. That means God is capable of visiting the sins unto the sixth and seventh generation. That means the sins of our forefather can affect our lives as unbeliever. But if you go further in that verse, it says, I show mercy. To thousands of them that love me. That means he is capable of showing mercy. That's why he visits the iniquity of the father upon the children. But he's capable of showing mercy. So why should we therefore need mercy? Some of us will say, well, I'm just a child. Since I was born, I have never seen. And there is no record of iniquity in my life. And if so, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fatness of wrath. Because what would the Lord rather require of us? To hearken unto his voice. The Lord is not interested in sacrificing. Would what God have preferred for man? Is it to sacrifice for sin? No. God would have preferred man remain a holy creature the way he created him. A perfect man. But when man decided to disobey God, he sold himself. Not because God is angry with man, because that is one of the mistakes we make as believers. We think because of our sin, God is so angry with us. He will no longer listen to our prayer. 
He will no longer answer us when we call. The reason is not because God is angry with you. It is because your sin has put a violation between God and you. Because you were not just the first being God created. God created other beings before we men were ever created. And those beings also have their shortcoming. And when they fell, they were not forgiven. They were thrown down. And because they were thrown down, the burden of hatred for man has always been there. That's why if you read the book of Psalms, it says, Who is man that thou art mindful of? And who is the son of man that thou should visit him? You have made him a little lower than angel in creation, for thou hast crowned him with glory, power, and dignity. And when you bring his only begotten son into the world, he says, Let all the angel worship him. So who is this man that you are mindful of? That God has created him, make him a little lower than angel in creation. But yet he crowned him with power and glory. So these angels, angelic beings were actually jealous of man. But for God to now say to man, well, your sin does not matter. But that of these angels, I'm going to punish them. That will convert God from being a righteous God to a sinful God. So because of that, God has to punish iniquity. And because he has to punish iniquity, it doesn't matter whether we sin as a man or sin as an angel or sin as a demon, we still have to face the consequences of our sin. And so because sin must be punished, there has to be a way to remedy the source of man. Since man commits sin in ignorance, because of that, there has to be a way. Their consciousness will not well develop when they sin because the devil deceived them. And because of that, despite the deception, if you go to the courts and you say, well, I stole, yes, I committed stealing, but I did it in ignorance. The judge is going to tell you ignorance of the law is not what? An excuse. So ignorance of the law is not an excuse. You're not going to say, God, the reason why I committed immorality or did the abominable thing in your sight is because I make mistakes. <laughs> The devil will say, yes, I also made mistake when I decided to be exalted above heaven, but I was thrown down. So he is the accuser of the bedroom. God is not the accuser, but the devil is. He accused you before God day and night. In the day of Job, he was present in heaven, standing among the sons of God, saying he had been going through and flow the earth and walking up and down in it. And certainly in the days of the early apostle, he is the accuser of the bedroom. He is there before them. He accused them before God, even till today, day and night. He doesn't rest. So he keeps accusing the bedroom before God, day and night. And how can God ever put a stop to this accusation? There is only one way. To redeem man back from the fall. And that became the power of what? It became the power of atonement, which is the power of forgiveness. So what is an atonement? Atonement is the restoration. So when Christian restore those things which were stolen back to the original owner, that means atonement was done. Well, remember when the children of Israel disobeyed God in the wilderness, God sent the serpent to torment them. And what is the significance of the serpent? The devil. He sent the devil to torment them. Whenever the serpent bites them, they cried out unto the Lord. And the Lord, who is of a merciful heart, who is slow to anger, but abounding his first law, heard their cry. And what did he tell Moses to do? He told Moses to make, instead of make an image of God, he told him to make a brazen serpent. Strange, why would God tell Moses to make an image of the, serpent, of the devil? And he told Moses to make this specific image, which was called Molech which later on the children of Israel turned into an idol. And when he made this image, he told him to hang it upon a pole. And he told them, whenever the snake bites you, look up to that brazen serpent. And whoever look upon it shall live. And what is God telling them? That sins demand judgment. And brass throughout history symbolizes the symbol of judgment. Sin being judged. If not for the writer of New Testament, we would not have understand the significance of why God said to the children of Israel that they should make a brass serpent, hang it upon the pole. 
except the writer of Hebrews says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever look upon him shall not be put to shame. So God, when Christ was hanged upon the cross, it was not actually God being hung upon the cross. It was sin being crucified. Because man sin. The Bible said by one man sin, all were made sinner. So by one man who is righteous, because how do we declare Christ righteous? Judah, Satan himself believed Jesus was righteous. Because Judah, even though he has already, Satan has already entered him and make him betray his master, he returned the 30 pieces of silver back to the chief priests and cast it at their feet, even according to Zechariah 9, 9 and said, I have betrayed an innocent blood. I have betrayed an innocent blood. The Pharisees said, see thou to that. They did not listen to them, to him, because Satan has also entered into their hearts. But Judah understood, despite being in the state of sin, despite being under the control of Satan, he knew that the person he betrayed was an innocent Lord. That means by Satan's own conviction, he declared Christ innocent. And that's why Christ himself said with his own mind that the God of this world cometh, but he has nothing in me. If Christ has died as a sinner, there will be no need for Christians to call upon his name. Because Christ was not the only person crucified that day upon the cross. There was two thieves that were crucified with him. One on the right and one on the left. How many of us ever pray to those thieves? Or cry and say in the name of those thieves we are restored. No, none of us will ever pray to those thieves. Because the Bible says, even though this, the death of a sinner cannot even pardon his own sin. Not to talk of pardoning the sins of others. Because your sins cannot be washed by your own blood. Because Adam and Eve tried it. When they discovered that they have eaten the forbidden fruits in the book of Genesis chapter 3, they, they decided to make apron for themselves. They made religion to cover themselves up. Religion is just an apron which man made for himself to cover himself from sin. So that people will say, well, when they say, how many Christians are here? You say, I belong to the group. Even though you knew fully well, within your heart, you are not one of them. But you just want to belong to a group, a group of people, a class. When you check the principle of that faith, you are nowhere to be formed. But you knew fully well within yourself that you are not qualified to be called one of them. What does the word Christian come from? Christian was first named in Antioch. And why was Christian first name in our church? Because the people behave like Christ. Today, we see Christians as a group or geographic region. As people that belong to the global south, that belong to some certain geographic location, or that attend churches every Sunday, that belong to either Agnican, Pentecostal, Catholic, and so on. That is not how the Bible saw Christian. Even though most of those doctrines were actually taken from paganism and idolatry, we still do not care. Even though Constantine himself was the one who instituted congregationalism, we still do not care. We believe that because these people belong to a certain group, they are Christian or congregational groups. No, that's not what qualifies you to be a Christian according to biblical standards. What qualifies you to be a Christian according to the Antiochic Christians is you are like Christ. The rudiment of Christ is formed in your heart. Your character is transformed. The fruits of the Spirit are evident in your life. You are born again. These are Christians. Christians are not people who go to church. Christians are not people who form congregation. Christians are not people who tick in their exam book, Christian, Muslim, or pagan. They say Christian. No. That's not what the Bible sees as Christians. Christians are not because you belong to a particular geographic group. Your father is a pastor. Your mother is a pastor. Your father can be a bishop for all I care. And you still be a pagan, not a Christian. It is very possible. Christians are not based on your study. 
If not, professor of theology would have seen heaven before many of us. Christians are not because you have master in divinity. The early apostles never had master in divinity. A lot of them were fishermen. They worked in boats. They were laborers. On land, unskilled farmers. That was whom they were. But God did not segregate them based on their knowledge or based on their skills. But rather, they were called Christians because the Holy Spirit was formed in them. And how was Christianity born? It was born in a mystery. That the Holy Spirit indwelling in us makes every individual the church, the house of God. The place where the Holy Spirit has fellowship. Where God's head is complete. No wonder God said, ye are complete in him. Because throughout the Old Testament, we were told that God is seven complete and man is one deficient. And because man was one deficient, that means man can never reach perfection. But Christ makes us understand that through the right of adoptions as son, we are complete. And no wonder the Bible said, ye are a royal priesthood. A choosing generation, a peculiar people. People who should show forth the praise of God, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Christians do not bend their head. Christians raise their head high in the streets. When they walk in the midst of their enemy, they are confident. Now I can see why most of them were stoned to death. Son and sonders, thrown into the lion den, and yet they were not afraid. Even though when they have to face certain deaths, they glorify God. And they celebrate. Like Stevie, he's opened his eyes and beheld Jesus sitting down at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Even despite being stoned. Why? Because what conviction did they have? These people cast their own way behind them. They sought for a city that had foundation. That the builder and maker of this city was not man, but was God himself. So today, we look into that life. What actually brings forgiveness. What is the power of forgiveness? Why should Christians forgive? Christians should forgive because God forgave us. That is the first principles of forgiveness. We don't forgive because we are a special people. No, we forgive because God has forgiven us. In Matthew chapter 18 from verse 21 it says then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? The question is, how often? There are a lot of people that can be really annoying sometimes. And this annoyance can make them do some stupid things to you. Some of them can be very frustrating, provoking, and an offense against your soul. And as a result, you are sad. You feel betrayed. Because that was how God felt when man did sin against him. God felt betrayed. Because he made us from dust. But he did not say, because I make them from dust, I will separate them. He had fellowship with us. Every evening, God will leave heaven. He will come to earth to have fellowship with man. That was the closeness of the bond which God has with us. And having that fellowship, God was ne never tired of having fellowship with man. He was walking at the cool of the evening in the garden to see man, his creature, only to discover that the man who was object of pride, which was object of glory, is now naked. Why was thou naked? Because disobedience. They ate the fruit which God told them not to eat. And as a result, they lost their spiritual clothing. And what was next was the attack of the seed of, of the serpents. And God has to make haste to slay an innocent lamb that has not sinned, that has not committed any guilt to cover man from nakedness. God forgave man in the garden. How come he still laid a foundational curse upon serpent and upon the woman which she multiplied his pain in delivery? Because the Bible says God is a merciful God 
who forgives iniquity. And he cleared himself to Moses when he revealed himself as the I am. And he said, he by no means cleared the guilty. God is going to forgive sins. Even if you kill, God is capable of forgiving. Even murder. But, it doesn't stop you from going to jail. It doesn't stop you from suffering the terms in prison. No. Yes, you are forgiven. Yes, you are forgiven. But you still have to face the consequences because every offense you do on earth hurts somebody. And because it hurts people, you still have to pay the penalty of those people. That's why in Christianity, we believe in restitution. For example, yes, I went to my friend's house. I saw a beautiful TV and I stole it and I put it in my house. Every day I wash it. I say, oh, Father, I want to repent. I have sinned. Please forgive me for stealing this TV. And God said, well, I've forgiven you. But what happened to this TV? But God has forgiven me. But every day, whenever I look at that TV, I remember it was stolen. Has my forgiveness actually been completed? The guilt will still be there. And how do we clear this conscience? The blood of Christ is the solution. The blood of Christ. To clean the conscience, first you have to get rid of it, like Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus was a worthy tax collector. It doesn't mean that you can actually restore everything you stole. It's not possible. But Zacchaeus did something that many Christians should emulate. First, he got rid of those things that were stained on his conscience, that would make him unfit to serve God. When he did sin, he realized that people will never see him as a believer as long as they live. Because why? He has made himself rich by the thing he stole from others. And he took by force. And what did he say? He follows the old law according to the Hebrew. That when, that do not despise a thief when he steal to satisfy his urge. But when the thief is caught, he should restore seven times. Zacchaeus went far beyond and said if I have stolen from anyone I will restore seven times that means he has invested what he stole, he was a wise man that he must have a lot of money to be able to restore what he stole by seven times and he said half of what I have which I cannot really restore for everything I stole because I don't remember even everybody I stole from I give half to the poor he was willing to give half of his word to charity to clear his conscience. Sometimes as believers, there are some restrictions that are not just possible. For example, when you were in a band of robbery, you kill somebody's child, or you kill his mother, or you kill his wife, it would almost be impossible for the person to even forgive you. It would take extra grace for you to go and meet the person and say, I was the one who killed your son. It may be wounds. Bringing back an old wounds will happen 20 or 50 years ago. God expects for your conscience to play, you have to rely on the blood of Christ. Because the blood of Christ is actually what washes you from dead conscience. If you can touch the end of his garment, his blood can make you whole. Then, does it mean if we do not restitute, we will not be saved or not meet with God in heaven? No, that's not true. Restitution is not the key to your salvation. It's only an act of salvation. It's an act of genuine repentance. It's a way of removing sin from your conscience. Cleansing your conscience and making it fit to serve the Lord. It does not guarantee your salvation. It doesn't mean whether you restitute, you will go to heaven or you will not go to heaven. That is not what we are saying here. What we are saying is that restitution becomes necessary when those things you stole, you can still look at it. And anytime you remember, you look into those things, the devil tells you, remember that thing is stolen. You have to return it. If you cannot return it, give it out as charity so that your conscience can be free. And that's exactly what God is talking about. And here, how many times will my brother do things that offend me every day? Because the Bible says, if any man offend not a word, the same is what a perfect man. 
Yes, everybody would love to be a perfect man that doesn't offend anybody in what he says, what he do, or how he lives. But unfortunately, it's not just possible. As long as we live on earth, offenses must surely come. But blessed is the man that is not offended because of Christ. Christians must be offended. Pastors must be offended. Your assistant pastor must not be happy with what you give him. The church member may not be happy with their pastor because of the way he preached sermon. Somebody might even accuse the pastor that the harmless sermon he preached on Sunday, he was preaching because he knew I had a problem with my wife. He used my family to preach. It's not because I told that pastor. It may not be you at all. It may be the Holy Spirit led him that Sunday to preach that message. But because you felt it hurt your spirit, the pastor may not even know that he offended you. You kept anger in your heart and you brought up malice against him. And as a result, anytime you see the pastor, you behave funny. You act strange. And the pastor looks and says, ah, but this brother used to be loving, caring, zealous in the things of God. But what happened? How come his spirit is going down? It's if some pastor that are brave enough, they call you for counseling. But the one that is, some brother will say, well, I'm not interested, pastor. I'm, I am very busy. I have time to, I, I have to go to work. But the truth is, if he is brave enough to ask you, what is the offense? And you now remember, you preach one message one Sunday, and that message offended me. And maybe the pastor may not even remember the message anymore because he preached under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And that message has been raised from his brain. But it was not erased from the man who heard it. And that is exactly where offenses come. So how many times will such offense come in a day? And now we forgive. Is it seven times? No. It's not seven times. But 70 times 7. It's 70 times 7 in a day. That means 490 times in every day will your brother offend you. And you will forgive him every day before you can take vengeance or be angry or have right not to forgive. Hmm. I bet nobody has offended me 490 times every day. So there are some people that will say this sin is beyond forgiveness. I caught my wife with another man. I remember a brother once said something to me. Out of all sins in the Bible, this was the only sin God gave man right to defend himself. That if your wife is caught on the act of adultery, <laughs> the Lord said, a woman was caught in the very act of adultery. He was brought before Christ. And the laws of the land suggest that that woman should be stoned to death. That is the law of Moses. That's what Moses commanded. Did Christ argue against the laws of Moses? No, he did not. He only sits down and wrote on the ground, waiting for them to make their decision. And the Bible, if I could recognize what he was writing, I believe he was busy writing their sin on the ground. And Christ believed that all sins are sin. Whether adultery, fornication, lie, stealing, whatever you call it, it's a sin. But none, the Pharisees did not see it that way. They saw some sin as more grievous than the other. For example, when a woman was caught in the act of adultery, the woman should be stoned to death. But the Bible did not say According to the laws of the Pharisees, if a man is caught on the act of adultery, what should happen to the man? Should the man be stoned to death? No law was ever written or such. Only the woman was to be blamed because in the ancient time, women were vulnerated. But Christ said, no, there is no justice in your law. But what should happen is any one of you who there is no sin in his life at all, should be the first one to cast the stone. And the Bible said, each of them reflect on their own sin. Christ did not stop them from stoning the woman, but he only asked them, if you know that since you were born, no sin was ever found in your hand, 
be the first one to throw a stone. Because today we have a lot of people. People put moral equivalent to others. They make themselves feel more important. Some even begin to justify their sin. They say, well, my sin is not as big as his own. Well, his own sin is bigger than my own. If God's standard of judgment is because your sin is smaller than that of another, <laughs> Satan will be in heaven before most of us. Because Satan's sin was only to think in his heart. He has not even committed it. So today we call him the devil. The old ancient serpent. But what about us? Some of us, we don't even take it. We commit it. And we did all sorts of abominable things. Yet we go on our knees and say, Father, forgive us and God forgive us. But what about us? Our brother commits sin against us. Do we forgive our brother? Sometimes people will say this sin is just beyond forgiveness. It's beyond pardon. How can I pardon somebody that did this to me? This sin is beyond pardon. There is no sin that is beyond pardon as far as God is concerned. The worst sin in the scriptures is the sin of witchcraft. Because the Bible says, suffer not the witch to live. But God said, disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. And that was the sin man committed. That means we are not supposed to be alive. Because if disobedience is as witchcraft, our forefather committed witchcraft before God by actively disobeying to God, eating the fruit he commanded them not to eat. But you know what God did? Instead of killing them because they deserve the punishment of witchcraft, he clotted them. Then what should you do if somebody do the same to you? Your wife, whom you married, was caught in the very act of adultery. How do you handle it? Should you be the first to throw a stone at her? Or be the first to cover her nakedness? Or act like Jesus? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wow. Forgiveness, remember, is not a ticket to trust. Why forgiveness might be mandatory for every believer, but trust has to be earned. The fact that you are forgiving people their sin does not mean the trust has to come automatic. No. The trust has to grow with time. The people have opportunity to redeem themselves by proving to you once again that they can be trusted. That's where many Christians fail. Oh, he forgive me. But how sure am I that he really forgive me if he did not restore me back to my position? No, the Bible did not say we, we forgive you, we should give you back the office of a pastor or of a bishop or of a deacon. No. When we forgive you, the Bible suggests you should be learning the principle again, the rudiment of salvation. So that when you stand to that limit, you will watch that position. That's what the Bible respected from us. Christians don't just forgive and say, well, we caught a deacon committing immorality with another man's wife. And as a result, where God said we should forgive, we are forgiving him. You can still remain as deacon. No, even God will be angry with you. Because he has failed the rudiments that qualify him to be a deacon in the first place. What God required of you is to separate that man from the brethren. Give him opportunity to deal with his own flesh. Not to hide himself from his own flesh. And when the disciplinary process of him showed real remorse for his sins and has come back to understand the consequences of his sin, he can be returned to his position. But not immediately. Because if you let me leave him in that position, he's going to destroy himself. And by trying to cover his acts, he will lack the authority to judge others. Because if you shall judge the angels, ought you not to judge the least among you? 
Now, let's go back to the scripture where we were reading. And it make us understand in that particular place. In verse 21, that how many often should my brother, we're not talking of enemy here, your brother, because some people think it's only an enemy that can sin against you. No, sometimes your family member, your father, your brother, your children, they can sin against you. How many often times will they sin against you? Sometimes 100 times, sometimes 50 times. And he now asked the Lord, how many often should my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? Is it here seven times? Where does the word seven times come from? Where does the word seven times come from? But Jesus replied and said to him, not unto thee, I say not unto thee until seven times. But until 70 times 7. Remember, 7 times came from the Bible, the Hebrews word. 7 times. The Hebrew used it to mean the Levitical orders, which is the year of Jubilee. Where every Hebrew slave is to set his master for 6 years. And at 70 years, the slave should be let go because it is the year of Jubilee. And that was what they were referring to there. But Jesus made him understand that the actual Jubilee is 70 times 70, which is the, after serving for 48 years, the 49th year is the year of Jubilee. That is the 490 days. That's 490 years. That was the number of years God forgave Israel. They offended him for 490 years. That's why he sent them to, to Ezra beyond Babylon for seven years. They offended him for 490 years. And he sent them to captivity for just 70 years. So that was the number of times God forgave Israel. So it was not just figuratively, but it was prophetically. If you read the book of Daniel, you understand the 70s, the sabbatical years. God was dramatically telling them this was the number of years God forgave Israel. So if you want to be able to hold something against your brother, if you under the law, not seven times, it has to be 70 times seven, which is 490 years. And I bet how many of us live to 490 years? That is the number of years you are to forgive your brother. Even if he continues to sin every day. So God is not going to say, he has been doing it before. Well, this time I will not forgive him again. If God expects us to forgive for 490 years, he expects you also. He is expected to forgive you also. For 490 years as well. And so that was his own standard. God does not. God does not lie to his standard. The standard of the Lord. Is the standard of the Lord. That number of years. God was talking about. Was actually the required number of years. For forgiveness. Which is in the Christian ethic code. And Christians should learn to understand that forgiveness is not something that in Christianity is probability. It's a must. If you must be saved, if you must be saved, if you must be saved, you must forgive others. Because if you do not forgive others their sin, God himself will not forgive you your own sin. Because the measure you measure to others, that is the same measure the Lord will also measure to you. That same measure 
which you measure to others, God also will measure to you again. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your own heavenly Father forgive you your own trespasses. It is a two way thing. If you forgive others, God will give you. If you refuse to forgive others, neither God Himself will also forgive you your sin. So the question for us is do we need God forgiveness? If we need God forgiveness, we must make it a point of duty to forgive our brothers also. But how do I forgive my brother? Somebody may ask. I have a situation of somebody that died last year and it says that this person family was responsible for his death. How should I still forgive such a person? Such a promising young man. His life was just cut short. And God is asking you, how much price were you sold for? The Lord that bought you from the hands of the slave master of sin, who punishes prisoners with continuous strokes, was sold for 30 pieces of silver. How much what are you? Are you more of more worth than your Savior? Your Savior did not threaten. Should you threaten? The Bible says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Like a sharer. As a lamb before the sharer is done. So he uttered not his word. He uttered not his word. How many of us will be accused of a capital crime, though innocent, but remain silent and open not his mind. But that was what he did. When he was attacked, he attacked not again. He gave his beers for them that pulled it out. They smit him. He smit not again. And he was taken from prison, from life, and he was Buried with the wicked in his dead, even though he has done no wrong. This is whom you should look up to. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. He was in the form of a God. He does not see it as a thing of robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He became obedient even to the point of death. If Christ, who bought you, was obedient to death, what about you? Are you of more importance than Christ? Verse 22. Jesus told us 70 times, 70 times. That times is well illustrated in the book of Daniel chapter 27. Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, verse 27. He make it clear that this 70 times 7 was 490 years that Meshach the prince shall present himself within the period of time. So 490 years the children of Israel sinned, but God only sent it to Babylon for 70 years. And why were they sent to Babylon? Because for 40 for 490 years, they did not honor the sabbatical order for the, for the land. Even God told them that six years, they, their slaves shall serve them. The seven years, they should let them go. What did they do? They actually let the slave go. They obeyed God in everything. But when the slave went, when the year of Jubilee was over, they went and carried the slave back and forced them back into captivity. And God said, well, no problem. As you have done, so will I do unto you. That was why they were sent to captivity in Babylon. It does not have anything to do with their personal sin. It has to do with their disobedience. Because God sees disobedience as a sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness as idolatry itself. So this were the sin they committed. And as a result, they were sent into Babylon for 70 years for Ezra. So, God, what is our emphasis to this? God is telling you, if the children of Israel 
we are told to forgive for 70 years, 700 and 490 years before they can take offense. You also, as a believer, you must be ready to forgive for 490 years before you can take an offense. So that means now, since the day you were born to the day you die, if somebody offend you from the beginning to the end, you ought to forgive the person. You have no reason, no excuse to keep an offense. If you must carry the mantle of Christ, you must be, you must be Christ. Are you a servant of the Lord? You must act like one. Because if you lay costs on people, every cost you lay, four hand is pointing back at you. Because those costs will also be at work in your life. The person you cost will remain stones. You that cost the person, you remain stones. Both of you will not grow. Because God did not cost when man said, Rather, he portioned their punishment based on their guilt. Because God does not clear the guilt. But forgiveness is divine. Christians does not have the power to say, I will not forgive. That's why when we come to counseling, the first principle you want to know in any counseling is, are you a Christian? Because if the person is a Christian, the counseling has just got easy. But if the person is not a Christian, then you have a problem. Because there is one law for the saved and one law for the unsaved. There is one law for the believers and another law for the unbelievers. The loss of the Christian does not apply to the unbeliever. So don't expect the unbeliever to come to your church on Sunday and respect your sabbatical law or your Judaic law or whatever, your Christian law. No. People who are believers are expected to behave in a certain way. That's why as Christians, we do not judge unbelievers. Because those who are in the church, God will judge. But those who are outside of the church, God will judge. But those who are in the church, we, the believer, ought to judge them. Because God has given all judgment unto the Son. And the Son has committed all judgment into our hands. And if we shall judge the angels, ought not we to be able to judge ourselves? But God is asking us a simple question here. In verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would have taken a who, who would take account of his servant? And when he has begun to recon, one brought unto him, which owe him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents of gold, for example. It's a huge amount. Today, it was more than millions. But this was what this servant was owing this king. But as much as he had not to pay. His Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife and his children, and all that he had in payment for his debts. Because it was a common practice in the olden days that when you owe debt you cannot pay, you will be sold, your family along with it, to pay for those debts. That is the kind of debt we as sinners owe to God. This debt, remember what the specificity of this is. That means your sin which you have committed, what should be sold? Is it only you? No. Because of your sin, you should suffer for it. The wife you marry into that family will inherit those sins which your great-grandfather and your grand-grandmother committed. They will all inherit the sin. You see the power of forgiveness? They will inherit the sin. And your children, born unto you, will also inherit the sin. Because God said, I am the Lord visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children unto the fifth, sixth, and seventh generation. But, and all that he had for payment. But, how can I ever be free from such a great bondage of sin? But the servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. Compassion. 
breaking ancestral tie has nothing to do with power has nothing to do with spiritual work it has to do with god's compassion the power of forgiveness understanding the rudiments of forgiveness that is the key the bible says it was written of old that the parent ate your right grape and the mouth of the children will be sour but the bible said not anymore a sinner be 120 years shall die for his own sin the children will no more suffer for the sins of their parents that is the key where does that come from forgiveness forgiveness has power beyond human imagination ability to forgive god is saying i will no longer punish the iniquity of the father upon the children i will no longer punish the sins of the children upon their parents i will no longer punish the wife for the sins of her husband but in the case of adam and eve it was not so in the case of throughout the bible history a can sin the wife did not sin the children did not sin but they were all stoned to death because their sin were visited upon all the generation all the family there is no history of Achan and his generation the root of sin was cut off and that is exactly one thing that god has repeated in our lives telling us that he will no longer visit iniquity upon the children because of his ability to forgive but does satan care no what of the ignorance an ignorant man will die an ignorance death so many people still remain under that same bondage despite that god has cancelled it from the beginning you know why the people themselves have no ability to forgive because if you cannot forgive men their trespasses neither will your heavenly father oh god these ancestral ties come and remove it from my family in jesus name the devil will ask you one question you drive your wife away because she committed immorality why did i remove the ancestral cause don't you remember what the holy book says that if you do not forgive men their trespasses that your heavenly father will not forgive you your own trespasses Therefore, your sin remain. Go and bring the best pastor in the world. Let him speak in all the tongues he knows how to speak and the one he doesn't know how to speak. Let him profess all the prophecy he knows. Even the one he doesn't know. The sin remain. Your iniquity will remain steadfast. Because why? It will cleave to you till the last day. The only reason it will cleave to you is because you refuse to forgive others their sin. If you must reconcile your family back through family reconciliation, you want God to forgive the sins of your grandparents, maybe they kill one little child for sacrifice when you were still in the womb, when you were not even yet born, or when your grandfather was not yet born. And you want God to forgive all those sins. Because remember what happened to Mother. The Bible says he shall be a fugitive and a vagabond all through his life. You know, some people say, in, especially in Africa, ghosts of the dead is haunting me. There is no ghost haunting you. Because the death, there is a barrier between death and life. And they cannot cross over. And the only reason why you are being haunted is because of the curse that was laid upon Cain. And the Bible says you will be a fugitive and a vagabond all through your life. That means you will not have peace day and night. Whoever see you will slay you. And whoever you see you will slay you. That's why mother that has killed once, they keep they have the tendency of keep killing. That's why we throw them into prison to keep from killing others. Because as long as he's remaining on earth, the blood of whom he has killed will be taking vengeance on him for seven times. And anybody that killed him, the vengeance will multiply 70 times seven, which is 490 times for the vengeance. And so because of that. A person tell you he see ghosts, he see spirit, he see different things. That is exactly the cause that are manifesting, and they manifest in different ways. And as a result, God is telling you the only key to it is forgiveness. And how come if you come out openly and confess your sin, the Bible says, "He that covereth his sin will not prosper with it." But how come if you come out? You say you see ghosts. What happened to the ghosts? How did they disappear when you confess with your mouth? When you open your mouth and you tell the family what actually happened? That now you have 
ask for their mercy and they say well we have forgiven you and you see those spirits disappear no more torment the reason is because there is power in forgiveness the power of forgiveness is what empowers spirits it's what removes evil spirit from your paths it's what liberates you from causes it's what break ancestral ties it was scattered demonic ties forgiveness because the greatest weapon against the devil is the weapon of love and love cannot be complete without forgiveness because the bible says love keep no record of wrong if you are a believer who keep no record of love of wrong the devil is already defeated in your life Forgiveness will be paramount in your in you, and God will make Himself known in your life. And what did He says? He says, "The Lord of this servant, He was moved with compassion. Why was He moved with compassion? Because this servant actually came and bowed down His knees in adoration, and humbled Himself and said, "Please, I know I did it." You were looking for the man that stole from your farm. It is me. Please forgive me. It's better than hide. Oh, you were angry with me yesterday because somebody spoke rudely to you. Sorry, it was my fault. I don't want to give excuse for it. I am sorry. It will stop the person. It is better to say sorry than to go to hell. It's better to say sorry than to take revenge than to look for another way to make sure you kill to cover your sin Cain killed his brother instead of confess what did he do he covered him in the earth and what happened did he solve his problem no the blood cried out from the earth to god even if you cover your sin in the earth the blood will cry out for vengeance the animal will dig up the grave. The beast of the forest will wake up the spirit. And they will haunt your soul. And they will keep haunting you until the day you die. Until you open your mouth wide. What did Jesus say? What I told you in secret, say it on the rooftop. Offenses must come as long as you live on the earth. The man who has the boldness to confess is the mighty man. Don't be too high in your office to confess your sin. Some people will say, well, I am a pastor. How can I open my mouth and confess that I committed immorality? The church will be scattered. The abominations will be too much for the people to bear. Hmm. To obey is better than sacrifice, we know it. To hearken is better than the fatness of wrong. If you know the abomination will be bear, why did you commit it? Now you have fallen into it. What do you do? You have to free yourself from the elemental forces. From the bondage of decay. From the demon who is hoping to put your blood into a covenant. And from all the forces of wickedness. Who are trying to do harm to your blood. This is an opportunity for you to free yourself from those bondage. It can only be free by simply repenting. Confess your sin one to another. So that your iniquity can be blotted out. So that your sin can... The Bible says, though your sin be as red as a sky. No sin is easy to hear. That's why evil people do everything in secret. Because they don't want anybody to hear about what they commit in secret places. Because it is an abomination to speak of what they do in the hidden place. And that's why they cover it with every cover. But the Bible says, whatever is manifested is come to the light. God is light. As children of light, let nothing be hidden in you. Don't live a life of secrecy. Live a life open to God's mercy, open to His grace, open to His humility. As a believer, if you want to prosper, confess your sin. Open up. Speak out about your sin. Ask God for mercy. 
and your iniquity can be forgiven. It doesn't matter how dirty your sin is. The journey of a thousand footsteps starts with a footstep. The journey of a thousand miles starts with just a footstep. Take a step. And that step is open your mouth wide. Say it. Ask for mercy. Be remorse for your sin. And that's all. God will take it over from there. Even if the person decides to kill you, rather than to forgive you, you have clear your conscience. It is better you die than to live in guilt. The Lord is full of mercy. He is of a sure love to forgive iniquity. Do you know what he said to Moses? Moses was not a perfect man. But the Bible said he was the most meek among God's creatures. But Moses killed. That means the sin of Cain is supposed to follow Moses several times. Because Moses killed an Egyptian. And if that Egyptian has killed before, that means the sins of the death of the Egyptian will be avenged upon Moses how many times? 70 times 7. 490 times. And Moses would be a fugitive and a vagabond all through his life. But you know what? His power of mercy. He met with the Lord. He humbled himself. He defended the people of God. And as a result, mercy was shown to him. His iniquity was brought out. So learn as a believer, while the consequences of sin is death, but the mercies of God give eternal life. Christians should understand, forgiveness brings life, while sin brings death. There is no sanctification without forgiveness. There is no purification without forgiveness. There is no redemption without forgiveness. Every atom of salvation starts from forgiveness. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive you your trespasses. It doesn't matter how well you can fast. It doesn't matter how well you can pray. If you do not forgive other people their sin, don't expect your own to be forgiven. Because God only forgives those who forgive others. Let us pray. Father, we heard your word. Your word came from you. You speak the way you want us to hear it. And you teach us the way you want us to learn it. Lord, help us to forgive. Oh Lord, help us to forgive others their sin. So that the same way you forgive us our sin. Because if we do not forgive others their sins, you will not forgive us our own sin. Lord, we have come to you. We say forgive us our trespasses. As we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Don't lead us into the temptation of the devil. But deliver us from the power of the evil ones. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pedro, we will see you again tomorrow by this same time.